So we're talking about the fact that from the very first few years of his priesthood, that Eugenio Pacelli's talents were recognized by every, really every single pope uh, um, from those earliest years of his priesthood all the way through to uh, up to his own election. Every pope under whom he lived before his own election uh, gave him uh, posts of significant dignity, responsibility, and ones that required significant intellectual ability as well. So his talents, uh, which were quite a few, were recognized uh, early on and employed in various different capacities, which included, as we mentioned last time, extraordinary intelligence, linguistic skills. We'll see that he was fluent in half a dozen languages. <laughs> uh, and um, even, there's even footage of him speaking uh, English, addressing, addressing uh, Allied troops in, in Rome in English during the Second World War. So linguistic skills, perseverance, and loyalty, and all of these popes sought his advice and service in international affairs. You may remember from last year, we talked about all of, we'll get into this a little bit, we'll touch on it a little, because we covered it last year already, uh, but the efforts of Pope Benedict XV to bring about an end to the First World War. It, those efforts were unsuccessful, but they were heavily, they heavily involved uh, uh, Pacelli, who at the time was the nuncio to, uh, to Germany. So we'll see a little bit of that and uh, the way that Pacelli himself reacted to the way that the war in fact concluded. But indeed, he was, uh, that was his first major uh, international posting, we'll say, was to, to Germany. He was sent to England a few times prior to that on some historically significant occasions, but uh, that was his first, though that was largely ceremonial. Uh, the, that was his first real uh, say position as a, a diplomat seeking to, to get uh, things done, we'll say. So uh, he did not uh, protest. Uh, when uh, St. Pius X called upon him, Pacelli, to assist in the resolution of a number of internal issues in the Church, including the elimination of the right of exclusion claimed and exercised by the Holy Roman Empire and a few other nations, uh, and used by Austria in the 1903 a conclave to veto the election of Cardinal Rampolla. Uh, we mentioned that, uh, that the Concordat of 1801 was unilaterally abrogated by the Third French Republic, that, that disgusting entity, uh, and that St. Pius X was very upset about that, 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 that unilateral abolition happened in 1905, and St. Pius X denounced it early 1906. And it was Pacelli who provided him with the material for that encyclical. Uh, whether he actually formulated the text as it, as was, it was then published, promulgated, uh, is something you have to look into. It may well be that so they just hired a Latinist to write the actual text. But at the very least, he was involved in formulating it to some extent, heavily involved. Uh, not, not just a consultant, but from actually providing material, uh, giving St. Pius X probably all of the historical facts of uh, uh, say an, an argumentation for the reasons uh, why this was uh, uh, why this was a travesty on the part of the Third Republic. The encyclical proclaims that the same rule applies to the Concordat as to all international treaties, namely the Law of Nations, which prescribes that it cannot in any way be annulled by only one of the contending parties. So it just says that any any contract, any any agreement, any treaty. Uh, cannot simply be, I mean, if one nation were to just back out of a treaty with another, that other nation would have a just grievance, obviously. And he's saying here that the Holy See has no less just a grievance with France for just throwing out this Concordat, which has stood for a hundred years and more. That, remember, that was even set up by Napoleon. Napoleon was the, he was not yet the emperor of France. He was the first consul. He had uh, sometime earlier dumped his army in Egypt, just left it there, and gone back to France to become the first consul, uh, and had himself in 18, uh, a, few, a few years later, they had himself crowned emperor by, uh, or, or uh, the stories differ as to whether he seized the crown and put it on his own head or had Pius VII crown him, but at the very least he, ha he dragged Pius VII to Paris, practically, in order to have him 
crown him Napoleon Emperor. Uh, and, uh, but that was a few years later. In 1801, he was ruling as, Napoleon was ruling as first consul, and as bad as he was, as much trouble as he, Napoleon, gave the church, he set up this concordat, which allowed certain things for the church, made certain guarantees, and uh, which he would, would remained in place. Now, Napoleon III, Freemason, Carbonarist, revolutionary, Napoleon III kept that in place. It was only the French Third Republic, uh, which trampled on it eventually in 1905. And we talked a lot about the history of the, the French Third Republic last year. Remember, it started out okay, at least, under uh, Maréchal Macron was the first, uh, you could argue that there was a president prior to him of that Third Republic, but uh, he was the first president of that republic after it was determined clearly that, okay, we can't, we are not going to be able to reestablish a Catholic monarchy here. Uh, there's too much disagreement as to who should be the king, so we need to, we have no choice but to go to a republican form of government. He was, uh, Macron, Patrice Macron, was uh, a devout Catholic, so it was okay when he was in, but then he, he resigned at a certain point, and after that everything just went downhill. So that's, remember, that is the situation we're looking at. All that persecution of the church, the law of separation of church and state in 1905 that uh, actually was that, that was the abolition of the concordat, or at least that law included it. Uh, that was, that's all the con continuation of everything we saw last year done by the, uh, the French Third Republic. That's part of it. So during the pontificate of St. Pius X, Pacelli seconded and quietly supported the papal actions taken against modernism. Do you remember all of that? Needs to be saw last year, even to the point of shutting down, at least for a time, the seminary of Perugia. That uh, all those measures that St. Pius X took against modernism, which were, which the modernists complained endlessly about, just endlessly, uh, all of that, Pacelli in fact supported. So there were some who thought, oh, this is all too harsh, we should be nicer. Uh, there were some who were saying that. Uh, Pacelli did not say that. Uh, clearly, he himself, as we'll see later on, of the, the modernists who, uh, was de there was a definite resurgence of modernism uh, after St. Pius X. They, they, they were shut down, exposed and shut down during the reign of St. Pius X. Cer certainly, uh, everything that, uh, well, I'm say everything that could be done was done. Uh, in retrospect, we could have used even more, but it was definitely, uh, modernism was definitely, uh, prosecuted with the to, sense to the full extent of the law. Uh, you might be may say at least uh, at least uh, in a broad sense that uh, it was uh, ever, ever, the measures against it taken were quite strict, as was necessary. That same Pius X saw was uh, to be necessary, and those in agreement with him uh, also saw as necessary, including it turns out Eugenio Pacelli, who would not maintain the same kind of strictness against the modernists during his own reign as pope. And that's really what set up uh, everybody, uh, quite, quite the opposite, in fact. Everybody who brought about Vatican II, all the, all the big names uh, of the council were all set up during his reign. So, but this goes to show that it was due to perhaps a weakness of character, uh, you know, a, a natural inclination to be non-confrontational, a natural inclination to be diplomatic, and in fact, a long training and career in diplomacy that led Pius XII to, as Pope to pursue a course of conciliation with, with the modernists of his time. And uh, that clearly didn't work. But remember, he canonized St. Pius X, under who, say, with whom he closely cooperated and with whose measures he agreed, to the point of, of canonizing him later, decades later, a half a century later approximately, but canonizing him, in fact. Uh, so really, and, and the, thereby uh, canonizing, of course, St. Pius X himself, but that means also giving a blessing to everything he did against modernism. Remember that the canonization of a saint not only includes the infallible declaration that that soul is enjoying the beatific vision, but also holds him up to the church as a model for imitation, uh, imitating which others may uh, attain to sanctity. So in other words, the message being given there is that if you're tough on the synthesis of all heresies, you can become a saint by doing that.
And that was uh, the modernists hated the fact that St. Pius X was canonized, including Roncalli himself, who after his own election, uh, in an interview said of St. Pius X, oh, he's no saint. And he's supposed to be the pope himself at that point. And uh, his, uh, his predecessor having canonized St. Pius X says, oh, he's no saint. And the interviewer came back with, was, said, it was not we who canonized him. <laughs> Why are you saying that? Why are you saying that to me? I didn't canonize him. And then he said, he, tried, he backtracked, Ron Colley backtracked that little. He, 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 he reeled that back in a little bit. But he still, made, so he still said something disparaging. Oh, even saints can go a little too far sometimes. And when we see Ron Colley and everything, uh, we'll see his early career later on. We have, we'll have to study him, go back into his early history as well. Uh, as someone who came up during the reign of Pius XII, we'll see how he was treated during the reign of St. Pius X and how he complained about St. Pius X and those who were carrying out the will of St. Pius X. Uh, so we'll see all that. And uh, one thing you notice when we go through all of this is that whenever you, you see modernists talking about St. Pius X, they're always complaining about him. But they didn't complain about any of these other popes. They didn't complain about Leo XIII, they didn't complain about Benedict XV, Pius XI, and certainly not Pius XII. But they complained about St. Pius X, even to the point of Roncalli himself, after his own election, still complaining about St. Pius X. I no, think they actually could not stand him because he was actually, I mean, that meant that he was actually effective against them, whereas the other popes in, in practice were not so effective, in practice. But all this goes to show that despite that weakness of personal weakness of character, it seems, uh, and also uh, certainly a weakness in policy in dealing with modernism that Pius XII was himself personally no modernist, absolutely not. He not only supported the penalties and actions imposed upon the adherents of modernism, but also sought to reinforce and expand the arsenal of measures that might be employed against the synthesis of all heresies. And that is what St. Pius X himself called modernism, the synthesis of all heresies. Yes? Is it true, Father, that uh, even Bacelli was in the Sodalizium Pianum? He, uh, I, I haven't verified myself whether he was actually a member, but he definitely closely collaborated with Benigni, mm -hmm. Umberto, Umberto Benigni, who had the, the, the Sodalizium in his contacts. So uh, definitely he was, uh, let's say, uh, his efforts were very much along the same lines as the Sodalizium, as, as, as far as his actual, perhaps, membership or or uh, what he actually did to, co to cooperate with them. We need to, need to do more research on that. But definitely, he did not disagree with the Sodalitium. And the Sodalitium Pianum being, in, you know, just as a, for anybody who may not know what that is, or if, uh, at least as a refresher, was effectively a, a spy agency <laughs> set up by St. Pius X to keep tabs on modernists. And they had lists of everybody. In fact, actually, I have a, I should bring a, a copy of it in. I'll probably distribute that at some point here. They had a list of all of the cardinals in the Curia. Uh, they, they, they had a list of everybody. They had kept tabs on everyone. All of the cardinals, so it, everywhere, actually. Uh, and some of, those, some of the notes they have on them are uh, rather scathing. Uh, and we'll bring those, I'll bring that in at a certain point. But it was actually, that was discovered in, it was not meant to be made public, but it was in fact made public in 1917, when the, 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 the office, the, the, since the headquarters of the, of the, of the Sodalitium in Belgium was, uh, was abandoned during, in the German invasion in 1914, and the Germans walked in, the Germ German army uh, went into the building and found their files there and discovered this list of, uh, of notes on all of the cardinals. And some of them are, some of them are amusing. Some of them are, are scathing, others are very revealing in, in various different ways, uh, the way that these cardinals were seen by the Sodalitium. So in other words, this was a, an agency that had a file for everybody, <laughs> everybody. And it was, uh, they had a file on Roncalli, a uh, suspect of modernism. It was later changed to unjustly suspected of modernism, but he was on record as having as having, uh, uh, since there was a poster with his face on it, <laughs> published at some point, <laughs> as wanted. <laughs> Even if he wasn't actually, yes, he was slippery. We'll see that one guy, he was very, very slippery character. That's how he managed to get, get out of trouble. So we'll see all of that. We'll see all of that. Pacelli had absolutely no quarrel with the papal condemnation of modernism in the encyclical Pascendi 
issued in September 1907. So that's uh, Pashendi is uh, a reading of that is indispensable for understanding modernism. We went through a great deal of it last year. We couldn't go through all of it. Time didn't allow us to do that. But that's uh, a little light reading for you, <laughs> which I mean, it's very dense. It, uh, it, but if you can finally make your way through it, it uh, there, there's no stone left unturned exposing the ugliness that is modernism. And uh, it just, just, just completely exposes all of their tactics, their agenda, their, ta their tactics, uh, their the different types of modernism, different types of modernists, the way they behave, the way they react to different things, all of that was just blown wide open. And we saw the reactions to it and how St. Pius X put down the reactions to it. There was, uh, I remember, just shortly after a book pu uh, published in response to it that St. Pius X uh, uh, forbade anyone to read under pain of mortal sin and excommunicated the publishers of it. So it did not, uh, did not allow any opposition to it either, which was the only way to deal with it. And he says in that encyclical that we've tried to be nice here. We've tried all of the, the, uh, the, the, the means of bringing, bringing back these erring people through diplomatic means, we'll say, and it just hasn't worked. The only, the only recourse left now is to, is to discipline them, which he certainly did, both in, in theory and in practice. You see, all of these popes, all of them, they, all, they were all perfect in theory. On the level of, of enunciating doctrine, all of them were perfect. And they all condemned modernism, def most, de most definitely. Benedict XV, who actually first stripped the Solitium Pianum of its powers and then shut it down. Uh, he, can, he reiterated the condemnations of St. Pius X uh, concerning modernism. So they were all in agreement that this is bad, and that the, the, the modernism is the synthesis of all heresies. There was absolutely no question on that. There were all, it, was, it was as though one person speaking when it came to that. But when it came to dealing with it in practice, definitely not. That the, all the others were much too soft. Uh, we, we can see in retrospect that they were. That, that's what allowed Vatican II to happen ultimately, and that's what we're doing here to a great extent is detailing that. So from 1906 to 1911, Pacelli collaborated with Umberto Benigni in combating modernism. Pacelli shared Benigni's determination to preserve orthodoxy, and in so doing was clearly in the anti-modernist camp, but he did not broadcast the fact. So here again, uh, clearly uh, his, uh, his, he is uh, clearly uh, subject, uh, so submissive to the church, absolutely, uh, and entirely committed to the faith and to preserving it, but in a diplomatic way. That's it. That's how he, you see that? That's how he does everything. Not to say that such methods have absolutely no place in this world, but they do have a limit. His opposition to modernism was reflected not only in his strict orthodoxy, but also in the fact that while others were censored and disciplined for their association with it, Pacelli continued to receive honors and promotions. So definitely, he continued to rise up through the ranks, so to speak, during the reign of St. Pius X, which means that you were definitely not a modernist if you managed to do that. There's absolutely no way. So in March 1911, Pacelli became a Soto Secretario, or Undersecretary of the Congregation of Extraordinary Ecclesiastical Affairs, and the following year he was selected to serve as an advisor to the Holy Office of the Inquisition, assigned to the responsibility of safeguarding the teachings of the church in matters of faith and morals. So yes, that's usually just referred to as the Holy Office. The Novus Ordo still has it, or still actually kept it around in, to a certain degree, but now it's called the, I think they've changed the, the labels a couple of times, but uh, for a long time at least it was known as the, the CDF, the Congregation for the, the Doctrine of the Faith or something like that. Uh, the joke is that that's uh, really, CDF really stands for Congregation for the Destruction of the Faith. <laughs> It was the, the joke for a long time. They, I think they, they may have changed it so that the, that the abbreviation doesn't quite work out in the same way anymore, but whatever the case. For a long time, yes, it was the Holy Office of the Inquisition, or the, which started out as the Roman Inquisition, not to be confused with the Spanish Inquisition, which was a separate entity, and that belongs to a separate era of church history to study. But the Spanish Inquisition was actually a state-run entity run by the Spanish state. The ecclesiastics were definitely involved, which is only natural in a situation of church and state being properly united as they were in Spain at that time. 
but that was still ultimately, you have to classify it as one or the other, that's a state-run institution, whereas the Roman Inquisition was an ecclesiastical institution, always was. And when uh, the, it was deemed that there was no more need for a regular inquisition, it became the holy office to which, indeed, uh, questions of all kinds of doctrinal and moral questions would be referred to the holy office all the time. And they would come down with various decisions. So, uh, for example, uh, a letter to the Archbishop of Boston condemning Father Feeney's novelties. That, that's, one of the, that, that's the kind of thing that the Holy Office would do. You know, it was not a decree, it was a letter, but still, the teachings of the Holy Office demand internal assent. So that's one thing that the Holy Office did. Also, they, uh, they disciplined uh, Galileo at a certain point. Uh, though that's a whole other story, that which is uh, very badly misrepresented. You, the usual version of it is not, not the case. When you look at uh, what Galileo was actually saying, you can see why he got in trouble with the Holy Office. Uh, but that also is outside of our scope presently. Once again, Pacelli's anti-modernism was not publicly displayed, for the pragmatic prelate did not wish to anger or alienate those who remained sympathetic to it. And that definitely is a foreshadowing of his own policies as pope, that he did not want to, uh, yes, to, to alienate irrevocably those who might possibly be called back. That was his idea. And we'll see that. We'll see to what extent he applied that and uh, whether or not the prudence of such decisions might be questionable. More public was his collaboration with his major patron and future cardinal, Pietro Gaspari, the expert canonist, in the formulation of the Codex Juris Canonici, which was eventually promulgated by Pope Benedict XV in 1917. So we have books by Gaspari in the library in the, in the canon law section. He was definitely an, an expert canonist, but he had uh, well, certain, certain problems. Um, Pacelli took part in this effort at the behest of St. Pius X. Remember, that was the project of St. Pius X. One of the many things that he set in motion was the codification of canon law. Remember, prior to the Code of Canon Law in 1917, it's not as though there were no laws in the church. It meant that the laws were very, very greatly scattered. In fact, there was a collection called the Corpus Juris Canonici, the body of canon law, which was a collection. Collection of all kinds of different decrees all put together. And they were code, they had numbers, there were canons, numbers of canons prior to the code in 1917. But the code greatly abbreviated everything, uh, condensed it very much. So it's, it's much, much shorter than what was once uh, in place. And uh, it changed certain things. A great many things were purposely left unchanged, but there are certain things were altered. And this was all, yeah, it took. Over a decade, we'll see that from about 1904 so to 1917 when it was actually promulgated, that was a work in progress. Finished in time for what became Pacelli's next mission, which was to Nuncio to Germany. But this was just one thing that St. Pius X undertook. Remember, he did various other things. Here. For one thing, he also reformed the sacred liturgy. Uh, he, the the St. Pius X missal and breviary that we use was, well, it was already, uh, to a great extent, things were the same before Leo XIII, but St. Pius X did change various different things. For example, it used to be that every single, uh, every single day was, uh, say, what the office and mass of the day was, was simply determined by the, uh, the rank of the day. So if you had a double, a uh, saint's feast that was a double that fell on a regular semi-double Sunday, it wasn't that, whatever, 15th Sunday after Pentecost, but it was instead that Saint's Feast Day. So if you look at it in order, say, if I, I saw an order from 1870 or 1871, there was one Sunday that was uh, the Feast of Saint Francis Xavier, I think it was. So instead of, which is a, a higher, which is, I think it's a double major, but it's, it's higher than a uh, semi-double, definitely. So that means that there were many more proper last Gospels previously. Never you had it. Now, nowadays, those are, those are considered simplified. So they reduced to a, as though they were simple, so they, they're commemorated at both first and second Vespers. But in other words, Sundays were, just regular Sundays anyway, were, were elevated significantly during the reign of, of St. Pius X. Also, another change, uh, one, of, one of the things that St. Pius X changed was uh, that um, psalms other than Psalm 118 were broken up. If you look at the, uh, the, the breakup of Psalm 118, it's actually in 11 different parts. 
uh, we start, we sing the first two on, on Sundays, the second and third Psalms of Prime on Sundays and feast days are the first two parts of Psalm 118. But Psalm 118 is actually recited in the office throughout terse, sext, and known. So it's, uh, it's divided up into 11 different sections and considered to be, in that sense, uh, rubrically 11 different psalms also spread out through the day. So potentially you're reciting it from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, and, and beyond, reciting Psalm 118. That's how long it takes to get through it. Uh, but prior to St. Pius X, that was the only psalm that was broken up. So now you find many different psalms broken up throughout the office. Prior to St. Pius X, that was the only one. So now we're in, in cases in which you have uh, one psalm broken up into different sections, and that qualifies as two or three, uh, perhaps different psalms in one hour. You know, previously, you had that one psalm was just one psalm <laughs> for that hour, and then you had other psalms, other full psalms in addition. So prior to St. Pius X, the office took significantly longer. So this might all, so all this will mean much more to you once you restart reciting the office every single day. But you see uh, the extent of the things which, which St. Pius X did. That's a part of it. Okay, so that's one of the projects, uh, the, code of, the codification of canon law, uh, uh, which St. Pius X decreed should be done. Bacelli was heavily involved in the effort of codifying it. A born negotiator and diplomat, Pacelli apparently believed that all problems could be solved by compromise and conciliation clearly which he carried into his papacy. His ability, discretion, fluency in more than half a dozen languages, his negotiating skills, his determination, self-confidence, and above all his loyalty to the church were all widely recognized and highly valued in the, cur in the Curia. So remember in that collection of congregations and other entities in Rome which are heavily involved in the day-to-day -day administration of the church, uh, he was recognized widely within that, let's say that, that body, that whole, uh, that collective body of all of those entities as uh, a man of significant talent, even great talent, and uh, therefore rose rapidly. It was clear that his temperament, training, interest, and loyalty combined to secure his position in the Secretariat of State. Undoubtedly, his career was also promoted by his family connections, so he advanced not only because of what he knew, which was considerable, but also because of whom he knew. So uh, there is definitely, uh, uh, yeah, as in any uh, organization, in this case, an organization with a human element, uh, you're, if you have a well-connected family uh, with, a, with a refined background, you're more likely to rise to higher positions. But at the same time, actually, when, when you consider it, uh, the, the church has, it might, has to be understood correctly, because otherwise it might sound bad, but a very definitely democratic element to it. I mean, the, the church is very strongly monarchical, let's not make any mistake here. The church is very strongly monarchical, but it has a democratic element to it in as much as potentially anybody could rise up through the ranks. You remember, St. Pius X was a farm boy. Uh, St. Pius V, similarly, actually, in fact, he was... Uh, you may know the story that he was, uh, uh, he was on a farm with his parents, and St. Pius V, that is. And uh, uh, one day, some Dominicans came by and said, uh, we, th no, we think you have a vocation, you should come with us. So he did, and uh, years later, returned to his parents' farm, but the, the farmhouse was burned down, and his parents were nowhere to be found, and he never saw them again. So what exactly happened to them, nobody knows for sure. By the sounds of it, nothing good, but it's impossible to say for certain what happened to them, whether they were killed when some, some war came to the area or um, bandits came through or whether they, uh, they sur maybe have survived and went someplace else and had no way of telling him. It's just impossible to say. But he was brought up on a farm and um, his parents are, and what even ultimately happened to them, how they died is in fact unknown. But that was you know, St. Isaac V, also a farm boy. And even, uh, say, one of it was Pope Sixtus, uh, well, the, 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 well, the first Pope Sixtus, I believe it was, who was uh, a slave who was a shepherd and rose up to the ranks to become one of the first popes. Uh, so there is definitely, in that sense, a democratic element in the church. Potentially, anybody could rise up through the ranks even to become pope. Uh, but in the case of Pius XII, he rose up through the ranks very quickly and very early because, in, in part, 
because of his family connections, which is natural in any any organization with a with, with a human element. Uh, that is natural that that should happen. Uh, but in this case, it was not without reason either. It was not not nepotism. He 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 had genuine talent. There's no question of that. His success commenced with the help of Cardinal Vincenzo Vanutelli, who was friendly with his family, with the intervention of Pietro Gaspari, who presided over the Congregation of Extraordinary Ecclesiastical Affairs, and had long been indebted to the Pacellis for legal and financial considerations, and also with the support of Leo XIII's Secretary of State, Cardinal Mariano Rampola, who was very, very liberal. And, uh, who had a certain Giacomo della Chiesa as his protege. Anybody remember who that was? Hopefully. Yes. Yes. Pope Benedict XV. Uh, he was known for that, being very much in the school of Rampola. And in fact, during uh, the reign of St. Pius X, uh, the, 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 uh, the Sodalitium Pianum uh, had a, had kept, kept an eye on della Chiesa, in fact. So you can see why he would uh, do away with them after it, uh, when he himself became pope. Uh, during the reign of St. Pius X, he was, uh, uh, he was given a, a see at a certain point, a, a, di a diocese. He was made the bishop of a diocese. But it was clearly with the idea of, remember, we saw that last year, promoviator ut amoviator. Let him be promoted so that he might be removed. The idea, the, the common English expression being he was kicked upstairs, <laughs> meaning... Uh, uh, that's a, it's a very common thing. It's, it's, a, it's an age-old phenomenon, that of giving somebody a promotion, putting him in some higher position, technically and officially, uh, but in reality it's for the purpose of removing him from direct control of a situation or from being in this or that place. Of, uh, perhaps just, it might be nothing more than a position of influence, but to get him out of that, just get him away from here somehow. It doesn't it, promote him, that's fine, just get him away from here. It's also a way of doing it uh, diplomatically in the sense that that person is removed from that situation, but he's not disgraced. He's been promoted and, and honored, technically. So uh, with, with the backing of all of the aforesaid, uh, the aforementioned figures, uh, uh, as well as that of others in the Curia, in 1901, Pacelli was admitted as an apprentice into the congregation of, uh, should be extraordinary ecclesiastical affairs, a sub-office of the Vatican Secretariat of State to which it reported. Considered the training ground for Vatican diplomats, this was the place that Eugenio acquired invaluable diplomatic experience. His early administrative efforts were bolstered by the enthusiastic recommendations of his superiors, uh, which led him to, or which, which led Leo XIII to dispatch him to London following the death of Queen Victoria in 1901, to convey the papal condolences to her son and successor, Edward VII. So, uh, man, anybody willing to uh, try to guess the dates of Queen Victoria's reign, which we've mentioned repeatedly, both this year and last year? <laughs> anybody remember what those are? They come up last class. The dates of her reign. Yes. 1837 to 1901? Yes, that's right. Yes, if you remember that. Those are also the, the date, coincidentally, the dates of the birth and death of Filippo Pacelli. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, no. The, the date of his birth was 1837, but the date of his death was 19, uh, 1916, which was the death of the same year that uh, Franz Joseph died, Emperor Franz Joseph, who, uh, who reigned Austria-Hungary from 1867 or the late 1860s until 1916. So it was a time of long reigns by monarchs. Edward VII had not last nearly quite so long. And Queen Victoria, the fact that the whole time period is known as the Victorian era because of her. You might, you might hear uh, talk about uh, Victorian era clothing or Victorian era household furniture, Victorian era styles of writing, things like that. Uh, that, that covers quite a few decades. Quite a few decades. She was only surpassed by the late Queen Elizabeth II. But uh, that actually, the, the uh, funeral of Queen Victoria in 1901 was quite the international event. Remember, at that time in 1901, the alliance system, uh, the, the dual alliance system uh, in Europe that eventually brought about the First World War uh, was well in place. It was, um, 
uh, things were very much forming along those lines at that point. But because half of Europe was related to Queen Victoria, half of the ruling parties of Europe were related to her, they all came to London for that funeral. So you had all of these heads of state, all of these monarchs, all came to London for this enormous funeral. So you had, uh, uh, again, they were all, all her grandchildren, Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, uh, Tsar Nicholas, of course, uh, Edward VII was uh, her son. But again, they were all, all of these were related, all closely related. They were all her children or her grandchildren. And it's actually well, partly because of that that uh, there were problems that arose. Uh, for example, the, famously the hemophilia of, uh, of uh, Prince Alexei, uh, the son of, of Tsar Nicholas II. Uh, that was due to, that was something he inherited from Queen Victoria. That was a genetic, that's a genetic disease, uh, which, again, those kinds of things manifest themselves in a, in a limited gene pool, which definitely uh, the, the ruling classes of Europe had become. So that was quite the event. Uh, many, many prominent figures showed up for it. And uh, among them uh, was uh, Monsignor uh, Pacelli, sent to convey the papal condolences to King Edward VII. So St. Pius X, uh, that was, of course, in the last couple of years, 1901, uh, was towards the end of Leo XIII's 25-year reign. He died just two years later, 1903. St. Pius X, who succeeded to the papal throne in 1903, and his Secretary of State, Raphael Meri del Val, likewise appreciated the potential of Pacelli in the promotion of Vatican interests and called upon him to perform various tasks and frequently sought his opinion. And over the years, Pacelli collaborated with a string of secretaries of state and clerics of differing persuasions, including Rampola, Mary Del Val, and above all, Gaspari. So, you may remember last year we talked about this, that, uh, that you know, De La Chiesa was very much Rampola's protege, to, to the max, as they say, and uh, that Mary Del Val had tried to prevent De La Chiesa's elevation to the cardinalate. And it is surprising, when considering how, just, uh, how uh, accommodationist we can say Benedict XV was, it is surprising to consider that De La Chiesa was uh, made a cardinal by St. Pius X towards the end of the reign of St. Pius X. So he was one of the last, if not the last one, then one of the last few people made a cardinal by St. Pius X. And in fact, the list of cardinals, those to be created cardinal, as the term is, the list of those to be created cardinal had the name of De La Chiesa written on it by St. Pius X's own hand. So he personally decided to put to elevate De La Chiesa to the Cardinal over the objections of Cardinal, Cardinal Mary Del Val. And it can only speculate as to the reason why, but it may well be that he, uh, St. Pius X, saw clearly the trend, which was, had, was, had, was well developed by that point, of going back and forth between accommodationist, anti-accommodationist, politicante versus Celante, candidate being elected. They figured, okay, this, this election is due for a politicante candidate to be elected. So I don't like the current ones who <laughs> are there. They're far too liberal. De La Chiesa is not nearly as liberal as the others. We'll make him a cardinal. Hopefully he will be elected as the, as the least, uh, yeah, hard to say how he thought of it, but potentially as the least bad choice, which in fact happened. 